Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. This is episode 30. Today, we sit down with Tom Secker. Tom Secker is a British-based writer, researcher, author, podcaster, and filmmaker. His specialties include the security services, Hollywood, propaganda, censorship, and the history of terrorism. He runs the Spy Culture site at www.spyculture.com and hosts the Clandestime podcast. And his latest book is National Security Cinema, The Shocking New Evidence of Government Control in Hollywood. Rifle upon my shoulder And a rucksack on my back Bullets, shells and shrapnel And a hellhound on my track When I made it to my home place I found triumph Shining city stood a fortress on a hill. Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. Thank you for joining us. For those new to the show, Danny and I are two progressive veterans who take the military and veteran stories of the day and add some much needed context. Tom Secker, uh, welcome to uh, Fortress on a Hill. We're really happy to uh, have you with us today. Thanks for having me. It's good to be talking to you. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to know, um, can you start with your blog and your podcast? How did you get your start uh, researching DOD influence in Hollywood? Well, I suppose it came out of uh, the work I was doing previously. Before that, I um, was looking into state-sponsored terrorism and the whole intelligence and security policy around terrorism. And when I finished that work, I was particularly looking at the London bombings in 2005. And when I finished that work, I realized I had a bunch of skills in terms of you know, I could podcast, I could build a website, I can do FOIA requests and these sorts of things. And I decided this was a good subject, that the whole area of government involvement in entertainment and entertainment as propaganda was something that no one was really specializing in. There wasn't a website out there that was, you know, archiving all these documents and things. So I thought, why not do it myself? Because, you know, it's easy to sit around and say, oh, there aren't enough people talking about this. There isn't people doing this. Well, oh, just absolutely. do it yourself then, you know, fill that space yourself. And so that's why I set up the site, spyculture.com, and started doing the podcast and filing all these FOIA requests, which have led to all this information. Uh, it's, 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 it's incredible the things that you've, you've been able to learn simply through FOIA requests. I, I think that's, that's, uh, that's just amazing. Well, yeah, I mean... Yes, about 90% of my information in terms of this area now is coming through FOIA. I mean, I started out by looking through archives and looking through the you know, electronic reading rooms that various government agencies have on their sites and compiling stuff from there. And then I got very proactive with it and just started filing dozens and dozens of requests. And I mean, one of the fun things about FOIA, if you're kind of nerdy about documents like I am, is when you go through the first lot of documents you get in response to the request, it will refer to a bunch of other documents and other communications and contracts and so on. And so you can then follow up and ask for all of those. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, one of the things that we talk about sort of shifting gears on the pod is, and we've done like a special on the movie Black Hawk Down, and uh, we've talked a number of times about like Hollywood and militarism. And and I'm interested particularly in a British perspective because um, I know that American film is is very you know influential uh, across the Atlantic as well. Why do you think that the vast majority, if not all, of American films depicting the military um, are complete sort of cheerleading films, and we don't have any of the anti-war drama that we had 
in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. It seems to me there's a there's a big difference. And you know, what have you found in your research that would explain why movies like Twelve Strong, movies like American Sniper, movies like Lone Survivor, they they don't take a look at the problematic foundation of the war. There really hasn't been an anti-war film yet in the American studios. And you know, why do you think that is? Well, like you say, it really changed around Vietnam because. If you remember the uh, certainly the post World War II period, Hollywood was churning out a dozen, two dozen war movies a year. I mean, literally like two hundred in the nineteen fifties, and I think the same kind of number in the nineteen sixties. And the vast majority of these were about past American wars, mostly about World War II, largely focusing on the Pacific rather than the European part of the conflict. But still, <laughs> and then Vietnam happened, and. For various reasons, Hollywood stopped making so many war movies. They certainly didn't make very many, uh, like big scale, you know, blockbuster style war movies about Vietnam as they made about World War II, for example. And part of the reason for this is because the Pentagon's entertainment liaison offices were they were reticent to support movies about Vietnam. Hollywood was primarily at that point, you had the uh, like the first movie brats generation. You had people making somewhat more radical films in the 70s. And as a result, most of the requests that were coming to the for support on various films were films that didn't paint a particularly good picture of Vietnam. So the DOD turned down the majority of these requests. When you actually look at the list of Vietnam War movies, the Pentagon only supported maybe 10 um, out wow. of you know, 50, 100. So it became much more difficult to make that kind of big, spectacular war movie that you'll remember if you watch 50s and 60s movies. Um, because without the Pentagon's support, it's very, very difficult to make those films. And as a result, war films in general kind of slipped off the agenda. You still got militaristic films, you still got you know big military action films, but they didn't tend to be war films. They didn't tend to be one army versus another. They tended to be, you know, um, like Rambo or something, you know, one guy against everyone, sort of the man who's doing what he's got to do, rather than a whole army fighting against another army. And then you get into the, the 90s and since then into the war on terror period. There are very, very few movies actually about the wars in the war on terror. There are some there really aren't many. And these days, most of the big militaristic films, certainly the big DOD-sponsored productions, they're not fighting another army. They're fighting aliens and robots and, you know, whatever. But they're not fighting another army on Earth. So the nature of military movies has changed quite fundamentally from the pre-Vietnam period to what we have now. And like I say, as a result, the war film kind of died off. It doesn't, you know, they still make some, but nowhere near as many as they used to. So I, I in, in thinking about that um, and about the, you know, the use of, of monsters and alien hordes and stuff to, to represent the other, whatever we happen to be fighting, you see more and more that, that they're never concerned with the, the big steps. They're never concerned with obliterating an entire city. They're concerned that a soldier got a DUI. And that you're going to talk about it. And I think mm -hmm. that those are, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of small minded scale that the military really wants both its members and citizens in general to view. You know, it's, it's easier, I think, to think of yourself as a, some nameless special ops sergeant with a neck tattoo and a big old beard, but it doesn't have to have really any honest connection if it can be an easy spawn point for somebody's imagination. So we don't, you know, we don't need the big ones anymore as long as we're fighting something that seems evil. And that got me thinking, Tom, what's what's the most outrageous change you've come across in your research? Both the most bizarre request and the most bizarre one that someone actually said yes to. Uh, do, you, do you mean in terms of script changes enforced by yes. the Yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Script changes, yes. <sighs> Um, that's a good question. The most bizarre one. 
I mean, honestly, actually, one of the most bizarre ones was a scene in a, I think it was a 1980 film called, I can't remember the title. It's about a film, it's about a Navy ship that goes into some kind of time warp and ends up going back to like two days before Pearl Harbor. And they have this big thing of, do we intervene in Pearl Harbor or not? Um, not a bad film. Uh, it's called The Final Countdown. That's The what Final it's called. Countdown. Okay. And there is, a, I think there's a scene in that where there's some um, some of the Navy officers are like playing golf on the deck. They're just knocking golf balls off into the ocean. And for some reason, they didn't want that in the film. They <laughs> they thought this was you know, sort of inappropriate behavior or some nonsense. And it's like, well, I'm sure that has actually happened millions of times on hundreds of ships. It oh, must God. have done. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what an absurd thing. Ah, uh, wow. Um, and there was another, I think there was another scene in the, in the same film where um, one of the senior officers was uh, walking down the corridor of the ship smoking a cigar. And he's saying, oh, no, no, he can't be smoking a cigar sort of indoors on the ship. <laughs> well, again, I'm sure that's happened countless times. And, and who do they think is going to be watching this thinking, oh, my, they're so unprofessional playing golf and smoking cigars. They're just, you know, people are just going to see, oh, that probably actually humanizes these people, makes them seem like they kind of normal they're just guys on a ship whereas the, to the dod they're like oh no no this is in some way in contravention of our pr policy it's just nonsense I'd, I'd wonder if they'd have the same problem with like the swimming scene in uh men of honor when they all jump in the jump in the ocean when it's really really hot outside do do they not think that we don't screw around that that <laughs> troops and stuff don't find the most absurd weird things to do yeah, no, it, but that's awesome. That's a that's a great one right there. Hitting golf shots. You recently did an episode on uh, mental illness depictions in uh, television and film for the military. And I found it really hilarious that in one of the memos that you got back, they asked, uh, and this is referring to a few good men, somebody actually asked, who are the few good men? Like this, this simpleton, this guy, whoever it was that was, was dealing with this is like, he can't even for himself point it out because there's uh, it's all become so nebulous to him. You know, it's, it's like you can't look at the, you know, this, these guys that mur- murdered this Marine, you can't, you know, look at them poorly or look at the other side that ma- make it good. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Sure. Th- this was some, um, which is ironic because most people who watched a few good men thought it was a great film and actually that the military came off pretty well. Yes. Um, uh, and I think actually the military realized this on reflection when they watched the film afterwards. They they kind of twigged. We we dropped the ball on this one. We were reading a script and not understanding it. But um, yeah, yeah, they 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 didn't like the Tom Cruise character. They thought he was a wise ass. They didn't want him to be. Uh, there's a line where he complains about having to wear the navy whites. I know they've now changed it to blues, but you know in those days they were navy whites. Yeah, and he didn't like them, and it was sort of. Well, you know, I'm sure there are people in the Navy who aren't big on wearing the Navy whites. So what? That's not like some big problem, is it? Um, yeah, this is the smallest, simplest little thing. I mean, every military member has some something they hate in that way, but we can't even can't even say it out loud. It'll get added into the pile of military criticism. Well, apparently so. That's the way they felt about it. But uh, And it's just an offhand remark. It's not exactly critical to the plot or anything but they didn't realize that you know the tom cruise character is heroic you know he's intelligent he is ultimately quite moral and disciplined at one point in the film he's sort of trying to abandon this case and he thinks you know i I don't want to do this i don't want to deal with all of this and he kind of gets talked around and he comes through and does the right thing well surely that's a a good character a positive depiction of a military lawyer isn't that in fact, exactly what you sort of want military lawyers to be, so that they're ultimately driven by moral purpose. But yeah, yeah, the Pentagon, they just, they didn't see it that way. So they denied them most of the assistance that they were asking for. You know, that doesn't surprise me because when you look at so many of these films, it seems that the DOD doesn't want the characters humanized. It doesn't want the characters to be flawed. It doesn't want to look at nuance. It, it, it appears that the DOD really wants uh, automatons who serve their country and always do the right thing, only that's not realistic. I mean, every squad of soldiers is full of, you know, human 
fallible beings. And uh, it, it just it appears to me that the DOD only wants to support films that spread their version of the message rather than anything that resembles truth. Well, sure. I mean, a few limited criticisms and a few sort of limited character flaws, maybe. But no, certainly nothing that's dramatic or genuinely humanizing, like you say. Uh, I think you made a very good point there, in fact, because another good example is on um, Godzilla, the 2014 version of Godzilla, because the central character in that is a Navy EOD tech. And in the original script, in the one that Pentagon reviewed, he was a bit of a, a bit of a con artist, maybe a bit of a liar. There was some kind of marital problem between him and his wife. And the Pentagon looked at all that and they said, oh, well, this is such a negative character. What are you getting out of this negative character? And the studio didn't really come back with anything. So they said, okay, change that, rip that out, you know, rewrite this entire central character for this movie. And as a result, you just end up with this totally bland, uninteresting, undramatic character at the heart of this movie. And, you know, audiences responded like that. Audiences, when they watched that film, they said, well, yeah, okay, Godzilla looks good and it film looked quite nice and it's quite spectacular, but the central character's just dull and unappealing and uninteresting. And so you think, well, on balance, wouldn't it have been better to have a character with a few flaws who was a bit more relatable and a bit more interesting? It wouldn't have it would have actually made a better film and probably ultimately been a better portrayal for the military. But like you say, unless it's this overwhelmingly positive straight down the line, we're heroes, we're here to do heroic things, and that's all there is to it, and forget about the PTSD and sexual assault and the invasion of foreign countries. That's not what this is about. It's about heroes, and it's about believing in the heroes. And (laughs) as a result, films are actually made worse by getting involved in the military. They actually have all the controversial, dramatic elements that make films interesting stripped out of them so that they don't end up offending Bill Strub and the rest of the entertainment liaison offices. Let, let me let me jump back in there. You know, I think that's really interesting what you say about the films getting worse um, when they bring the DOD in, because you mentioned earlier that the DOD really wouldn't support many of the Vietnam War movies, correct? Mm-hmm. And yet there were some really beautiful artistic movies great pieces of film that came out of Vietnam. And of course the DOD wouldn't support them. So for example, two films in the aftermath of Vietnam about the war win best picture, 1978 Deer Hunter, and then 1986 Platoon. These are phenomenal films. And I think what makes them phenomenal is they look at the damage that war does to human beings, that's the first thing they do. But the second thing they do is both of those movies questioned the veracity and the morality of the wars. Now, of course, the DOD doesn't want that. Um, But that's what made those beautiful films. And what strikes me is that if you look at Lone Survivor, American Sniper, 12 Strong, none of those films are willing to question whether we should be fighting these wars. Because if they were to do that, it appears to me they would get no support from the DOD and no major Hollywood studio would touch them. Am I, am I way off base there? Uh, only in as much as American Sniper was actually rejected by the military. I think even for them, that was a stretch too far. <laughs> um, a story that essentially heroizes someone for being a psychopath. Um, right. A racist and an anti-Muslim bigot. Yeah, I think for them, that was a bit beyond the pale, even for the sort of film that they like to support. But otherwise, yeah, yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying, is that look at most of the best Vietnam War movies, uh, the ones you mentioned, Full Metal Jacket, um, Apocalypse Now, all of these films were rejected by the Pentagon or never went to them for support in the first place because they knew they wouldn't get it. And that's... (sighs) That tells you something. It tells you that when filmmakers are free to make the film that they actually want to make, they make better films and they make more critical films and they make more uh, philosophically engaged, inquiring, sceptical films, particularly when it comes to war or the security state or the military-industrial complex or the other elements of that. And 
this is one of the things we said in the book in, in national security cinema is that, okay, Hollywood benefits because they get access to stuff. They get access to vehicles. No one's seen before or filming locations. No one's seen before. Um, the, the Pentagon benefits because they get to rewrite these scripts and turn these pieces into PR and propaganda for themselves. So the only real losers are the audiences because we end up with this conveyor belt of very similar, very tedious films with little imagination or controversy or skepticism or questions or anything that you can you know, latch on to and actually come out of that film and say, there's something to talk about here. I mean, when was the last time someone came out of the Transformers film saying, yeah, that was dead interesting. It made me think about this or it made me question that. It made me wonder about this other thing. That's never happened. Yet everyone who's seen Full Metal Jacket comes away from it saying, yeah, that really provoked some thoughts and that provoked some unusual feelings and some complex human emotions in me. And so, yeah, the, the losers are, are the audience. And the winners are the Pentagon and the Hollywood machine. And that, yeah, that's not something I'm very happy with. So. It, it's really, it's disturbing. I, did you see, just to jump in one more time, did you see the movie 12 Strong? I haven't seen it yet. I've read so, hundreds of yeah. pages of army emails. Uh, <laughs> right. The there were so many things that bothered me about that film that I just, I just feel the need to say for like our listeners and, and, and just understand, you know, kind of get a sense of what you think of this, especially given that you have so much more research, but this was a film that had an opportunity to really look at the nuance that is inherent in any complex counterinsurgency. You know, the, the, the green beret team, um, in the true story, it's based on a true story. Uh, they meet up with this warlord named General uh, Dostum, who is now a, a estranged vice president of Afghanistan, amazingly enough. And there was this opportunity to look at the moral quandary of working with a warlord, because, of course, in real life, this is not depicted in the film, although it should have been. In real life, General Dostum is one of the most bloodthirsty warlords in Afghan history. He suffocates prisoners to death. He tortures Taliban prisoners. Um, he commits mass murder. And there was an opportunity to like dig into that and to, to sort of ask the question of like, wh when can you bend the rules in order to win a war? And, and instead, they made this into the most simplistic heroicism movie and avoided that moral question, which was, which was the truth. So in, in the interest of entertainment, in the interest of making the Pentagon look good, they took the most interesting drama and the truth, and they sucked it right out of the film. Have you, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? And, and did you see anything about that in your pages of research? Well, I mean, certainly that follows a pattern of all of these films, to be honest. Um, that the context in which the conflict is taking place, the why, isn't part of the equation. It just isn't a factor in the story. It's all about the how. It's all about the, oh, you know, mm. they managed to ride horses on, you know, bareback horse riding. How, how heroic and how cowboy-like. And doesn't this evoke that old feeling of America and all this kind of stuff? Rather than the, why were they there? Why were they doing this? Is it right, like you say, to be getting involved with a warlord in order to try and fight a counterinsurgency? No, those elements aren't, simply aren't allowed in the script. And actually, the army emails, make, certainly the early ones, when the requests first came in for support, they make quite frequent mention of the fact that the CIA, CIA element of this story wasn't going to be in the script. And I do wonder, if it was, would they have approved it? Because the fact is, they were quite willing to approve this film. And they kept, you know, making a point of, you know, the CIA element won't be part of the story. And so you do kind of wonder if they'd approach them with a more politically true story and a more politically curious and sceptical story, would they have got approval? Probably not. Or, or at least it would have been one of those things that they asked them to remove. But yeah, yeah, I mean, Lone Survivor is a great example um, of this, you know, a mission that went horribly, horribly wrong. But they never asked the question, should they have been there in the first place? 
and that's the kind of even for me watching that film even despite the film being the way it is i came away and that was the thing i kept asking myself was well if they'd never been in there in the first place none of this whole stuff would have happened and maybe there's a lesson there but that just it just isn't there for consideration there is no um I mean, Lone Survivor is the perfect example because it's such a down-the-line, Pentagon-sponsored piece of utter propaganda. Um, you'll notice the film starts um, at a military base. There's no build-up to this. There's no... Like, you could have a montage of news clips of people talking about the war that will at least give you a sense of this is a piece of history. This is something that actually happened. There are reasons for this. There are consequences for this. None of that. It is simply the operation. It's just the how, the what happened. Nothing about why. Nothing about whether this is moral. And that's that's every film pretty much the DOD has sponsored for the last 30 or 40 years. Yeah, it's the deliberate subtraction uh, or the deliberate you know, subtraction of all context from the film. And, and and I think it, it damages the story and it substitutes platitude for truth. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, like I say, there are a few limited criticisms allowed and a few sort of limited moments of reflection. I don't know if you've seen the National Geographic series, The Long Road Home, which filmed for months on um, Fort Hood. Fort Hood in Texas, they actually built a set, like a 30,000 square foot set on Fort Hood in order to produce that TV series. It, so it effectively is being co-produced by the army at that point. Um, and there is a scene in that where one of the um, soldiers who is wounded in this battle that's portrayed in the series, um, where it sort of shows him several years later, and he's disabled. He's, um, he's in a wheelchair. He suffered quite a terrible injury. And there are, at this event that he goes to talk about this, there are like peace banners and Veterans for Peace uh, T-shirts and that kind of thing. But the uh, producers actually checked with the military before putting any of that on camera. They said, is any of this going to be problematic? The fact that they're asking permission to include even just one scene that suggests maybe peace was a better option or that some of these people are now peace activists of some sort. The fact that they had to ask permission to do that tells you, I mean, just how much control the DOD has over all of this. Because that's like one little, you know, two-minute scene in an eight-hour TV series. Um, and yet they still felt obliged, oh, you know, can, can we put a Veterans for Peace t-shirt on this guy? And it's like, well, he was wearing one at this real event, so I don't see why you feel the need to ask permission you know, have some balls. Just do it. Yeah. Um, it. It takes the art right out of the right out of the production. I mean, it, it shows the. You're right. It shows the power of the the DOD that they're even asked. I mean, it seems to me that they shouldn't even be con- they, they they shouldn't even be consulted if it comes down to truth. Um. No, they shouldn't be actually. Um, And there are instances of them actually insisting on things being taken out of films that were true. (laughs) Despite all of their proclamations about, oh, you know, we're concerned about historical accuracy and, you know, military accuracy and making sure everything's just portrayed how it really is. That's their excuse for doing all. But in reality, they do the opposite quite often. And not just as a matter of accuracy, but also as my, my point of view in terms of the relationship is, okay, so Hollywood goes to the Pentagon and you say, you know, we want to film on Fort Hood for a couple of weeks or whatever it is. And they say, okay, it's going to cost you this much. If you want us to drive these tanks around for three days, it's you know cost this much per day per tank. And you pay it to them and you reimburse the government for the costs of whatever they're doing. Fine. Why have a script review? Why even have that process? Why does the military have any right to be looking at the script and saying, oh no, change this, take this out, change that to there, we don't like that character, rewrite this? Why do they even have that right? Given that they are effectively just a contractor at that point. It's like if you went to, you know, if you, if you wanted to film on someone's farm and you said, okay, I'll pay you however many hundreds of dollars per day to film on your farm, 
and they turn around and say, oh, no, I want to look at your script in case there's anything in there that I politically disagree with. You just say, screw it, I'm going to go and find another farm. But you can't do that with the military. You don't really have that option. So they've got you over a barrel. And that's, you know what I mean? It's just not how any other normal relationship would work in the private sector. It's only when you get involved in government and you're asking them for something. And even when you're forking over hundreds of thousands of dollars for all of this nonsense, they're still saying, no, we have to have absolute line-by-line veto control over your script. I just, I don't see why. I don't see how that's legal. I don't see how that's fair. And I don't believe it should be happening. On a, on a larger scale, it doesn't seem like it marries up with the First Amendment either. No, because you, I mean, it doesn't. It, you're, you're interfering with mo- movie creators' ability to express themselves in the way that they want to, and you're putting up substantial stuff in between them and, and getting there. So, yeah, it, it, it's fucking horrifying. I'm, I'm really sick of it. Um, Tom, I'd like to hear uh, a bit about your book, National Security Cinema. Okay, well, this is something that came out of all of these FOIA requests, is that um, about maybe four years ago or so, I made contact, or somehow he made contact with me, whatever, uh, with Matthew Walford, an academic who's written quite extensively on this issue, um, and on the related issue of Hollywood propaganda outside of the government-sponsored realm. And so, through discussions with him, we embarked on this research trip, um, I mean, like virtually, uh, <laughs> whereby we bounce ideas off each other. Oh, let's see if we can get this document. Oh, we've read about that. Let's see if we can get that. Um, and this helped, you know, focus my FOIA research. And so when all of this stuff came back, and as we gradually put all the pieces together of what we'd actually got, we realized, you know, there's more than enough for a new book here. There's more than enough here to kind of blow the lid off this entire subject. So we sat down and wrote a book. Um, <laughs> it didn't actually take all that long. We only spent, oh no, I suppose we spent about a year putting the actual book together. But it came out in June 2017. It's been all over the media, to be honest. We've actually been fairly lucky, fairly fortunate with the amount of press attention we've managed to get, which is quite, you know, um, <laughs> makes me quite happy. Yeah, and it is all about this. It is all about not just the DOD, but also FBI, CIA, NSA, how they've also done this, how they've also rewritten script content, how they've also manipulated entertainment media for propaganda purposes. And so it's a compilation of all of that kind of information and a look at the industry as a whole. And the middle of the book, the kind of the bulk thing, the center of is a series of case studies of specific films. This is how it looked originally, and this is what you ended up watching. And it's kind of a, you know, how the sausage is made sort of process that we were trying to lay down in those sections. So, yeah, I mean, it is the most broad and up-to-date book on this subject, which is what we tried to make it. It isn't comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, We hold our hands up. The documentary record on this is pretty piecemeal, even with all the stuff we have been able to get. So we don't know what they did on the vast majority of the products. We just know on the ones where we do have the details, this isn't just about, you know, accurate dialogue or someone wear that uniform or that uniform or who can actually be addressed in this situation. It's about political and social censorship. And that's, as you say, a violation of the First Amendment. Government is not allowed to benefit a film that says what it wants and deny that same benefit to a film that doesn't. That's what the First Amendment implies and even basically states as regard to this whole process. And yet all of these government agencies are in flagrant violation of that. Speaking of of violating government agencies, I... uh... I listened to your most recent episode where you and Matt were talking about the two differing sets of rules for the elite in a country and for the citizens of the country. And you guys were talking about the royal family and some stuff about Harry and William and something Danny and I take 
great issue with is the American version where people like Hillary Clinton or David Petraeus get away punishment free where Reality Winner, or Thomas Strait, even Julian Assange, they all get the book thrown at them. And we recently had this happen where an Air Force squadron commander in uh, Connecticut, I believe, flew a fighter jet to a conference in D.C. because he wanted to meet his mistress there and D.C. was closed down because of a snowstorm. He, uh, I, I laughed for a little bit and then I just got really mad. He got to retire one grade down. And other than that, he wasn't officially punished at all, as far as I know. But what I'd like to know from you, Tom, is how would that play out for a British military officer? Does the, the, does the British military give out the war states equivalent of a golden parachute? Or is that a lot more difficult over there? No, I think it's relatively similar. Possibly not quite as obvious and, and kind of gross, if you like, as it is in the US. But it's the same kind of story. I mean, I remember actually when uh, Prince William, um, he borrowed <laughs> borrowed an Air Force helicopter in order to fly across the country and land it outside his girlfriend, then girlfriend's house, Kate Middleton, the one he's now married, um, in order basically just to show off. And it's like, okay, fine. If you were a helicopter pilot and you wanted to land your helicopter on your girlfriend's house in order to impress her, I get that. I get the the impetus for it. But you shouldn't really be using, firstly, you shouldn't be doing that with a military craft. No. (laughs) Um, And secondly, you shouldn't be doing that spending public money. Um, and instead of this being like a disciplinary issue, it was all treated as like a you know a boy's jape. Oh, look at what a grand old lad he is, kind of thing. Um, now, if that was an ordinary soldier, they'd probably get into a bit of trouble for it at least. But I'm not sure it would be that treated that seriously. It is the kind of thing that you know once you're part of that club, and particularly if you're an officer. Because if you're an officer, then you probably went to Sandhurst or somewhere, which means you're actually part of the social class, not just, you know, a talented military person who made it through to office. Then you can do more or less whatever you like, it seems. I, I, I didn't expect anything different. I, I, I had hoped a little bit, but it's it's I think it's just the nature of the, the changing lines of the institution, because we everybody, whoever's in charge at the time, determines how we define success and the military dances to that tune until it changes so as long as as long as we're it's an always changing institution and nobody wants to change this kind of stuff is going to keep happening oh yeah yeah uh i want to shift focus a little bit to one of your um one of your clips that i listened to and and also uh something i read and it's about uh, my favorite tv drama of all time which is the wire um, HBO's The Wire, which I think was okay. one of the great films, uh, uh, the great television series of all time. A- and you wrote in your season three review, which of course is the season where a rogue police commander named Bunny Colvin legalizes drugs essentially in a small part uh, of West Baltimore as an experiment. And and you wrote that in the review, you said, I look at season three of The Wire. In this season, the Barksdale storyline comes to a climax while the city hall politics are added. I examine the Hamsterdam experiment where one major – where one police major decides to legalize drugs in certain parts of his districts and whether the portrayal is realistic. I also explore the police comp stat system and why it makes it harder, not easier to solve crimes, and then this is what's most important, I think, and why an intelligence-based approach to counterinsurgency is always superior to a military approach. So as I read your – I thought very astute observation there – it jumped out at me because when I watched The Wire, all the seasons, but especially season three, I felt like the depiction of the Baltimore Police Department, the depiction of the bureaucracy of policing and the militarization of policing was incredibly similar to the army that I have served in for the last 18 years. Incredibly similar to my experience in Afghanistan. The way the police, uh, you know, policed West Baltimore was remarkably similar to the way that we policed or that we militarized East Baghdad when I was there. And I was hoping you could kind of give me a little insight into that 
show, especially that season, and and what you learned about the intelligence based approach to counterinsurgency versus the military approach. Well, sure. I mean, one of the things I love about the third season of The Wire is the whole thing is a series of insurgencies and counterinsurgencies. All of the power relationships they built up in the first two seasons are kind of threatened and thrown against one another. So you have things like McNulty in the Major Crimes Unit is essentially an insurgent. He's going off and doing his own thing. He's rebelling against command and so on. Um, you have on the streets, you have the uh, established power of the Barksdales being threatened by the new gang led by Marlowe. You have, in effect, the entire drugs industry being an insurgency against the police's occupation of the city. So, and, and when you listen to David Simon talking on the commentaries, he's quite clear about this. He's saying, you know, this whole thing is kind of a parallel. It's kind of a metaphor for the war on terror, as it's been fought so far. And this was in whatever, 2005, 2006. And, I mean, to, to your point about counterinsurgency, it's that I've studied a, some of the history of this. I mean, obviously, there have been a lot of insurgencies and counterinsurgencies fought. But... From what I've seen, a military approach where you simply try and crush the insurgency through superior force, through greater violence than they're able to project, has never worked. It has never been successful. It has never resulted in a peaceful, stable society. Whereas the only counterinsurgency have been at least somewhat effective in achieving the aim have been intelligence-led, have been based around, well, rather than we bomb this insert house or shoot it up, whatever it is you do militarily, rather than do that, what we try and do is recruit them. Because if you can recruit them, you can get information. You can find out more about the insurgency that you're fighting, figure out who the leadership are. You can figure out whether that leadership is liable to you know, bribery or some other form of persuasion in order to stop fighting, or whether they're just going to fight to death and therefore probably your best bet is to actually talk to them and assassinate them. But just, you know, sort of killing a random insurgent in the street is a terrible way to try and fight counterinsurgency because you just end up with more recruits for the insurgency. Because whoever you kill, that person's going to have relatives, that person's going to have friends, and some of those are going to be on the fringes. Of and if someone they know dies they're much more likely to join that insurgency, which means all you're really doing is, I suppose, you know, in military terms, a violent, pure violent approach to insurgency actually has a force multiplying effect for the insurgency, not for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> therefore, you end up just creating more enemies for yourself. Whereas, if you form uh, an intelligence network, if you recruit informants, if you flip some of these people, if you go up the chain and find some of their leaders, manage to flip some of them, or at least negotiate with them on the basis of information that you gathered, you might have a chance. You might reach some kind of stability. You might... Now, ultimately, most counterinsurgencies are fought by established powers. So I'm not saying it's a great thing, but... For example, the Huck Rebellion in the Philippines was ultimately put down to an intelligence approach. Nonetheless, it's better than if they just bombed the Philippines. So, um, in those terms, it, you know, when you're comparing a not great situation with a potentially much worse situation, the intelligence-led approach to the, the better of those two options. Um, and yet, it's hardly ever been pursued in the it's just, you know, because they've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right, which is why we're entering our 18th year of this war, the longest in American history, which is saying something because America has been at war for most of its history in some way or another. It's really interesting what you say. I, I've experienced this. So has Henry. Uh, I've experienced it in Iraq and Afghanistan. Henry's experienced it in Iraq twice. Um, I've also written an article where I sort of argue that the original sin, as I've called it, of the war on terror was calling it a war. You know, instead of taking an intelligence-based policing approach to a non-state entity like al-Qaeda, instead of that, we declared it a war, we operated in a conventional warfare manner, and we ended up occupying these societies. And through our military occupation, we actually grew the insurgency. We actually 
put wind in the sails of the insurgency. And the reason I like The Wire so much, specifically season three, is because Bunny Colvin, the rogue police major who legalizes drugs in his district, he says that about mm. the drug war. You know, he, he has this quote that I'm going to read um, where he essentially, you know, he, he says the war on drugs – the problem with it is calling it a war, and then he explains why. And I was so struck by this because you could insert the term war on terror where he says war on drugs, and it would work perfectly. So in this one scene, uh, Bunny Colvin is talking to one of his subordinates, a, 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 a drug enforcement unit sergeant. He says, he says, this drug thing, this ain't police work. I mean, I can send any fool with a badge and a gun up on them corners and jack a crew and grab vials. But policing, I mean, you call something a war and pretty soon everybody going to be running around acting like warriors. And pretty soon, damn near everybody on every corner is your fucking enemy. And soon the neighborhood that you're supposed to be policing, that's just occupied territory. Well, if you substituted terror for drugs and soldier for warriors, I, I, I was so floored by that quote. And uh, to me, it really it really described the war on terror better. And this is my point. The Wire, using the allegory of the war on drugs, in my opinion, has actually been more truthful, more accurate in its depiction of the war on terror than anything that the DOD has sponsored in Hollywood. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, and not just because The Wire is a brilliantly written, brilliantly constructed TV show, but mostly because of what you said, because they're actually being honest, because they're saying we're looking at this so-called war on drugs, which is essentially just a sort of war on urban America. As far as I can tell, it's just a war on poor people. And then you look at the war on terror. and It's like, well, there again, it's mostly just seems to be a war on poor people. <laughs> um, it doesn't seem to be accomplishing an awful lot in terms of reducing the threat from terrorism, as if that was even the aim. But, you know, um, and yeah, what you end up with is occupying a territory where you're supposedly trying to root out on terrorist organization. I mean, that was the, the, the complete joke for me in the, in the Afghanistan war, is that Al-Qaeda never numbered more than a, a few hundred people. So why do you need to occupy a country? Why did Britain and America and the rest have to <laughs> go in there with full military in full military mode and try and take over the whole country. Would not it have been better to simply maximize intelligence gathering and very careful targeting of specific people in order to destroy that gang? And the other joke of it is that Al-Qaeda, at least in that form, was largely destroyed within a few months. And yet here we are <laughs> over 15 years later. And is the war still going on? It, it's kind of like in Orwell's book, yes and no. There is a war in Afghanistan, but no one's really paying much attention to it. No one's pressing for this to be brought to a peaceful conclusion. No one's seriously digging into it and saying, is this not probably the biggest failure of US foreign policy in history? Which I think it is. Um, and as a result, it's, it's almost forgotten. And like you say, Hollywood doesn't do much good in terms of this stuff because they're they, the only film they've made about the Afghan war in the last couple of years has been 12 strong. Um, yeah. Although on the subject, have you seen the uh, film War Machine, the Netflix movie? Yes, and it's excellent. It's the best depiction of General Stanley McChrystal. Obviously, that's who Brad Pitt is uh, supposed to represent. Absolutely brilliant depiction of the psychosis of the senior generals and their um, devotion to the idea of counterinsurgency, despite all evidence that it's not working. Well, I mean, that's an interesting example because it's a quite militarily realistic film. You know, there's a lot of military hardware and what have you in it, but none of that came from the DOD. It came from the military of the United Arab Emirates, who obviously mm. didn't place the same kind of script restrictions on loaning their stuff as the DOD would have. And it gives you, it's, it's just a great example of a film that was made outside of the studio system, nonetheless with some big stars, 
was militarily realistic, at least in terms of production value, but wasn't politically compromised as a result. So it can be done. Films like that can be made, and they can do well. A lot of people watch that film. Most people I know, when I ask them, they've, they've seen it. So, yeah, it is possible to do it outside of the machine. It just doesn't happen anywhere near often enough. Did either of you guys see uh, The Siege with Denzel Washington and Annette Bening? I have, and it's incredibly prescient and almost predicts the problems of the post-9-11 war on terror to, to such an extent that a, a conspiracy theorist would almost – conclude that the director and screenwriter knew that 9-11 was in the works because for a film made in for a film made in 1998 it's incredibly astute i mean incredibly incredibly prescient but it, it i i i really admired it on its honesty and allowing bruce willis's character when they had that big uh conference room meeting where they were talking about what are they going to do with all the bombings in new york city and he makes it very clear to them what it means for his men to come to their city. He doesn't muck around with it at all. It's not a, you know, 10,700 soldiers are going to be marching through New York City. It's not going to be confused for a VFW parade. There's no there's no safety in that. No one can feel any safety in that. With law and, enforcement, and he, it has, you know, we 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 want to use our elected representatives to change laws and, and, and make things better. But when it goes straight military again, yes, soldiers are trained to shoot and kill. That's it. They're not humanitarian aid workers. They know very, very little. It's just hammers hitting nails. Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, I mean, there's a great quote also where he says, uh, Bruce Willis, before he becomes a maniacal uh, uh, dictator in the streets of Brooklyn. Uh, in the beginning of the movie, he says, "He says the army is a broadsword, not a scabbard. I mean, I mean, not a scalpel." And to me, that much like The Wire, ten years later or so, um, shows that this militaristic approach to counterinsurgency or to terrorism, rather than the law enforcement approach, which is the approach that eventually succeeds in the movie. Um, Denzel Washington leading it. It's very similar, and 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 I thought it was an excellent film. Uh, I would I wonder if the DOD had any role or if the intelligence community had any role. I, I'm not sure. Tom, do you know anything about that film? I don't think the DOD were involved. I'm I'm trying to remember. I think someone, some government agency was, but I just. Uh... Sorry, I mean, there's so many of these. That's yeah. the problem. I can't remember off the top it's of the, my head. The, 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 it's, <clears throat> one of the, the suspects that they found was actually tortured to death. And they depict them. Right. You didn't see him tortured to death, but you knew exactly what happened. They didn't mill around with it at all. Absolutely. I, I was a very honest film. Uh, yeah, Tom, I agree with you. It is. It seems very unlikely the DOD would have supported that um, because of the critique of the military tactics towards counterinsurgency, especially because of the violation of the Posse Comitatus Act, where martial law is declared and an active duty army division is used to police the American people, which, by the way, I believe we're one major terrorist attack away from that. We're one more 9-11 or 7-7, as you guys had in the UK. We are one more attack like that, I really believe, away from something similar occurring. And it's really disturbing because sometimes art can be truer to life uh, than, than, than other aspects of uh, nonfiction. Well, I mean, I think you're certainly right about all that. Um, one thing I will add is that something I've noticed in more recent script changes that the Pentagon has asked for uh, is is stuff relating to this, not necessarily to military matters or even the depiction of the military themselves, but law enforcement and the whole security state side of things, rather than specifically to the military. For example, uh, the NCIS spin-off series set in uh, New Orleans, um, they didn't like the early episodes of that because in their mind, the NCIS agents came across as thugs. That's their word, thugs. And so they sat down with the producers and they made it clear to them that if they wanted any kind of military support for this series in the future, that that depiction had to change. Um, do you know in uh, the, the Superman film, Man of Steel, there's a scene where the FBI raid the newspaper offices, the Daily Planet offices. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And again, 
again, the military were bothered by the fact that the FBI were kind of thuggish and brutal, and they kind of you know stormed in there and started bossing people around and everything. And they said, oh no no no, you've got to tone this way down. They've got to be very professional. They've got to follow protocol, all of that. And I'm thinking, well, okay, but isn't that the FBI's job? Is to be rewriting their image in, in Hollywood? It's not. It's not really the Pentagon's job to do it on their behalf. Um, so it's, they are also concerned with these things, with these more political issues about the security state and the growth and aggression of the security state in the post-9-11 world, is that they want these things to be toned down. They don't want people like us to be noticing just how, how brutal all of this so-called intelligence gathering really is. So, yeah, they're not just concerned with the portraits of the military. They're concerned with the image of the entire security state as we know it. Well, and, and a great point that you make there, because there's such a fine line, at least in the United States, and I'd be interested in how much this is true in the UK or not true, but in the United States, at least, there's such a fine line between the military and the police. Um, 50 years ago, there was a very distinct difference between the two. But today, the police have become so militarized, so much so that if you look at the Ferguson riots, when you there was no army there, there was no military there, but the police looked like soldiers. They were wearing fatigues, they were driving armored vehicles, and they were carrying assault rifles. And then an even better example is after the Boston Marathon bombing, which was a terrible event. Don't get me wrong, a terrible event. But four people died, three civilians in the bombing and one uh, security officer from MIT, I believe. So four, I believe there's four deaths. And, and the response of the police shutting down the entire city making everyone stay indoors and going house to house looking for these terrorists, wearing camouflage fatigues and driving around in armored vehicles. I mean, it, it was frightening. And, and so in that sense, it does not surprise me that the Pentagon would come to the defense of the security state because the Pentagon is now, I think, so inextricably linked to the police, so inextricably linked to the police uh, industrial complex so that there's really no difference anymore between our local police and our uh, active duty armed forces. I mean, in this country, it is a bit different because, uh, I mean, for one thing, in this country, police aren't usually armed or not with guns. Um, they are armed with other weapons, but they're not usually faced with the same kind of, I mean, we don't have the same kind of degree of gun violence and what have you. So it is a bit different, just culturally speaking. We don't have quite the same culture around all of that. But nonetheless, um, I remember in the wake of the Manchester bombing last year, uh, troops were deployed on the streets. Now, that was one bombing. Okay, a horrible bombing, stupid, pointless, disgusting act of terrorism. No question about that. I mean, blow, blowing up a pop concert. I mean, how, how low can you get, really? Um, but what does putting troops on the street accomplish? How does it stop a bomber? Because a bomber could just be any person with a backpack, right? could just be any person carrying a bag. Well, the military have got no idea whether that person's got a bomb in there or not. So putting them on the street doesn't actually, as far as I can tell, accomplish anything except help normalize this notion that our response to domestic crime, because that's what a terrorist attack is, it's a crime. It's not a threat to national security, it's a crime and should be dealt with as that. But no, by resorting to some kind of military response, it helps normalize the notion that this is a threat to national security and therefore warrants and demands some kind of militaristic response. And I'm thinking, no, it doesn't. It warrants a serious investigation and you try and find the perpetrators. Isn't that how you're supposed to respond to a crime? It, it's it's very, very disturbing. Um, and, and I agree. Uh, when I there's just, just you know as a, really my last point of the day, and I'm not sure that it even relates to your expertise, but I've I've worked with the British Army um, to some extent as an officer. Um, I've uh, gone through some um, practice exercises with British officers from your version of the Command and Staff College, so um, majors and captains. And uh, speaking with them, they did uh, tell me that the culture is different in. Uh, in the UK, in the United States, and I'm sure you're an observer of American sports and of American pop culture, the military is absolutely adulated. I mean, we're treated like we can do no wrong and we are, um, I would say over adulated, right? It's all about thank you for your service and glamorizing militarism. 
They told me, and tell me if this is true, they told me that in the UK it's not really like that, that for the most part soldiers are seen as um, just servants in another job and there's not the same level of just grotesque public militarism and grotesque public adulation. Um, has that been true in your experience? And also, does that reflect positively or negatively in British films or uh, uh, British TV series? I, from my perspective, I'd kind of agree with that. I'd say the culture is different, not that it is necessarily less militarized, but that the the nature and the tone of the militarization of pop culture is different here. Whereas in the US, you'd get, I don't know, uh, half a dozen fighter jets flying over an NFL stadium. You know, it's big, it's loud, it's very visual, it's very spectacular in that respect. Now, that does occasionally happen over here, but more often is that you will have like um, uh, like an honor guard of 20 or so uh, military guys st stood at the edge of the football field when the players are coming on. It's much more kind of respectful and understated. And that might actually just reflect a kind of cultural difference between pop culture in America, which is a bit bigger and brasher, and popular culture over here in Britain, which is a bit more kind of staid and understated. But nonetheless, it's still very militarized. There is still a military presence at a lot of major sporting events. There is still a military presence in our schools all the time. There is still a military presence at various kinds of public events. Um, in fact, they even essentially rewrote and renamed and redefined um, Remembrance Day in this country to be a kind of military day. So it wasn't about remembering the fallen from past wars, which is, you know, that's something that's worth, worth doing, worth being part of your culture, and just became a kind of generic PR day for the military. And so they're doing it in a more subtle way. They're doing it in a less noisy and less obvious way than Hollywood and the NFL and so on. But nonetheless, it is there. Um, I mean, uh, one of the quotes from a, uh, a Forces Watch report on military recruitment and PR in schools, they, they quoted from a, uh, the Army head of recruitment, I think he was, and he said that the way it works in this country is a small boy sees a parachute uh, trooper at some kind of country fair or whatever when he's a kid, and it's exciting and interesting. And then slowly, drip, 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 over the following years, we get through to him. And, you know, he becomes one of us. It's more done like that. Little, subtle things. Relatively continuous, but nonetheless there. <laughs> Whereas, like you say, in America, it's kind of just a bit more obvious. But as I say, culturally speaking, that is one of the differences between Western Europe and America. America does everything a sort of a bit bigger and louder and more obvious. Yep, if it's not bigger, it's not American. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tom, I uh, I, I really appreciate you coming on with us today. Um, will you tell me about uh, what you're working on right now and where listeners can find your work? Okay, I mean, I suppose the the thing that we're working on currently is we're trying to make a some kind of documentary version of national security cinema, hmm. and there are several parties in, involved in, or at least interested in doing that. And so we're working with some academics and trying to develop funding and, you know, developing a script and some ideas for how the thing will actually be. I have no idea when that will be out, to be honest, because it's quite early stages, but there is a documentary version coming, I suppose is what I'm saying, that sooner or later it'll be finished and it'll be out and people can see it. Because that was always like the next logical step. The whole subject is so cinematic. Why not make a documentary? about it you know oh absolutely um, in terms of finding out more of my work i mean pretty much it's all on spyculture.com i host a podcast there called clandestine where i get into lots of different aspects of this legal aspects financial aspects the script censorship the whole the whole thing really um and you can find all the documents i've obtained i've posted pretty much all of them up there for free so if reading documents is your thing or if you just want to kind of have a flick through them just to see that I'm not making all this up, um, yeah, uh, feel free to download them. But yeah, spyculture.com, that's the place to go. All right. Sounds good. Uh, thanks. That's great, Tom. Thank, thanks so much for coming on. I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. I, I enjoyed it too. Yeah.
Hey everyone, I really hope you're enjoying the podcast, but truth be told, I need your help. No, I don't need you to move a couch or borrow a leaf blower. No, I need you to hit pause on your podcasting app right now and share this episode with somebody you know, somebody who you might think might be receptive to it. It could be a, a friend or relative who's considering joining the military or a veteran you know who might be interested in, in hearing a little more truth in their news about uh, military and veterans. We rely on you all to help us reach as many people as possible. So please hit that pause button right now and share this episode with somebody. Share it all done? Good? Okay, good deal. I know Uncle Al will cuss a lot listening to the episode, but he'll appreciate it when the cursing stops. Now I want to mention something about Patreon. We are always in the market for more Patreon supporters. So if you get the chance, please come out and support us. You could support us for as little as a dollar a month. And what do you get for your dollar, you ask? Well, you get a one-minute drop on any topic you choose once a month. Just email us your question or comment, and we'll give it the old Henry Danny breakdown on air. Guaranteed to have 60 seconds of our time. We may spend more on it. Um, we prefer to do military and veteran topics, but whatever topic you think might be pertinent. And we may spend a whole bunch more time talking about it, depending on the topic. And for contributors, a bit north of a dollar a month, we have some bonus episodes, some essays of mine, and a few other things as well. We're still in the process of, of building our rewards. So if you have any suggestions for Patreon rewards, please let me know. I'd like to take a moment here and thank by name our four honorary producers that are supporting us on a Patreon. And they are Matthew Ho, Will Arens, Gage Counts, and Fahim Shirazi. Anyone who contributes $10 or more on Patreon each month will be listed as an honorary producer. To everyone else who contributes on Patreon, thank you so much as well. Your response has been really wonderful. 